Good morning. My name is Dane Swanser. I'm a history, uh, I'm a junior history major. Um, I'm an editor in chief of the Carltonian, and it is my, and I'm thrilled to have the honor to introduce Alex Friedman. Alex Friedman, one of the world's most esteemed journalists, is a global editor for ethics and standards at Reuters. Under the Thomas Reuters Trust Principles, Reuters is pledged to preserving independence, integrity, and freedom from bias. In the news, they gather and publish. Arguably, Reuters is the world's least ideological major news organization, and Friedman is the watchdog, making sure they retain that distinction. As a member of the senior leadership group, she works closely with reporters and editors on major stories, final reading many signature pieces, and holding all to the highest of journalistic standards. A longtime leader of ethics training at the Wall Street Journal, she oversaw ethics and standards of high impact stories in the paper and on the Dow Jones newswires. Friedman has spent much of her decorated career as a reporter, with a keen focus on topics that require unusual reporting skill, courage, and dedication, and that, in her hands, have produced stories of enormous resonance and enduring impact. Friedman was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1996 for her investigative reporting on the tobacco industry and has been honored with numerous other accolades, including the George Polk Award and two Gerald Loeb Awards. She is a graduate of Harvard University with a bachelor's degree in history and literature and also a Carleton parent. Please help me in welcoming Alex Friedman. Thank you all so much. With an introduction like that, I sort of feel like I can't possibly measure up to it. Can you all hear me, by the way? Can you hear me now? Okay, I was just saying that with an introduction like that, um, I, I don't feel like I can measure up to it. So thank you very much, Dale. Um, let me know if you're having any trouble hearing me, um, and I'll, I'll try to speak louder. I'd like to begin by um, giving you all a pop quiz. Here's question one. Do you believe that you, your community, <clears throat> and the world are best served by impartial journalists who rigorously check their facts and set the record straight when they mess up. Question two, do you prefer to rely on online news sources that align with your own views and opinions? Question three, would you be willing to rise to the defense of press freedom, preserving the unfettered flow of factual accurate information and the safety of the journalists who deliver it. Thank you. Question four, do you believe that this cause isn't worth fighting for because most news organizations can't be trusted to be objective and nonpartisan in the first place? Before you dive into this quiz, I'd like to provide some context. This is a tumultuous time for journalism, particularly for traditional mass media that make up the so-called fourth estate. Since 2005, about 2,200 local newspapers in the United States have closed, including 100 that shut down during the pandemic. At least half dozen newspaper chains have filed for bankruptcy. Newsroom employment is down by more than 50% since 2006. And while digital use may be up, that owes primarily to three titles, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. But while many newspapers are withering, there has been a flowering of disruptive technology and business models. The so-called fifth estate, those social media and non-mainstream sites from Facebook and Twitter to Reddit and Substack allow all comers to tweet and blog untethered from the commercial considerations of powerful publishers. There are many positives that flow from the democratization of the media landscape. For instance, crowdsourced reports and videos posted by citizen journalists have given global audiences on the ground, excuse me, have given a global audience 
a fast, crucial understanding of wars, humanitarian disasters, and historic events like the Arab Spring. But there is also danger. Like other mainstream or legacy media organizations in the fourth estate, Reuters, the international news agency where I work, is publishing in an era where there is a global war on facts and the impartial journalists who deliver them. The attacks are multi-pronged, from governments and politicians, from oligarchs and other moneyed interests, and from those who traffic in hate speech, fabrications, and conspiracy theorists. Excuse me, conspiracy theories. To a large extent, the influence of all these antagonists has been amplified by the vast opportunities provided by the Fifth Estate operating outside the mainstream media. The result is a serious erosion of respect for the work done by journalists trying to report the truth. Study after study shows the degree to which the media increasingly is disdained, disparaged, and deeply mistrusted. Last year, one such influential study called the Edelman Trust Barometer found that worldwide, 59% of the public believe journalists intentionally try to mislead people by reporting new things they know are false, and that most news organizations are more concerned with taking a political position than reporting factually. In the last year, trust <clears throat> in media declined in 15 of 27 countries, according to Edelman, with Australia and Germany falling into the mistrust bucket for the first time. The US, the UK, and France were already there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even though Reuters is consistently ranked among the most trusted news organizations, this widespread mistrust spells dangerous days for all journalists, including the 2,500 who work in our newsroom. And it spells danger for billions of citizens around the world who rely on us. It is hard to square the opprobrium heaped upon my profession, given what so many journalists do. Inform citizens, expose wrongdoing and corruption, improve or even save lives. I'm going to share with you how Reuters does its work at this most perilous juncture for journalism. Hanging in the balance is the future of media and even our own democracy. Reuters is the place where I serve as a combination referee and firefighter, maintaining our standards. It's the newsroom. I know best. Our commitment to accuracy and fairness is long-standing. Of course, our key competitors also seek to be accurate and fair, and they are. But our commitment is arguably more binding. Our trust principles were established in 1941 during World War II, when there were threats of censorship and propaganda around the world. These principles, which commit us to independence, integrity, and freedom from bias, <clears throat> are laid out in black and white. And a board of directors makes sure we uphold them. They are binding on every employee in the company. Our rules are few, simple, and we try to stick to them. Here's the cheat sheet. Number one. Be first and be right. If you must choose between the two, be right. Putting it another way, speed is a virtue, but haste is a vice. Number two, verify facts even when they come from the horse's mouth. During the editing process, we try to double check and triple check our facts. Number three, Practice what I call no surprises journalism. Before we publish, 
we strive to make sure our subjects know everything we are asserting about them, and we seek their comment. We make a particular effort to go the extra mile when we think that sources may be adversarial or their reputations may be damaged by our story. If we can't get new comment from them, we quote what they have said in the past or we quote one of their credible defenders. Four, we disclose key facts that may undercut our premise and also disclose what we don't know. In our stories, we try to embrace nuance, complexity, and contradiction. The goal is to bake into a given story the most convincing arguments that persuasively undercut our premise. And I said undercut, not corroborate. <laughs> you know, we, we want to tip our hand to plausible competing truths. We also share the limitations of our knowledge, the unsolved mysteries, and the holes we couldn't close. Number five, aim for neutrality in style and substance. Over the years, I've noticed that when one of our reporters likes a source and agrees with the source, they describe the source as explaining. But when those reporters disagree with the source, they say the source is arguing or insisting. That's when I take out my red pencil and go, says. Um, I pay close attention to the words we use, focusing on whether a story has an overly prosecu prosecutorial, hyperbolic, or conclusory tone. We just want to present what the facts can honestly support. I'm also on the lookout for biases, however inadvertent, that sometimes creep into stories. For instance, on occasion, I've asked a reporter why the accusations of an advocacy group have been given more credence than the denials of a company or industry when this advocacy group didn't give us any underlying proof of their incendiary claims. Six, and now I promise you I'm wrapping up. Correct mistakes comprehensively and as quickly as possible. Our goal is what I call radical transparency because the willingness to correct really matters. A recent poll for, by the R Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press showed that correcting mistakes is the single attribute that is most likely to engender trust in media. Getting to bottommost factual truth requires a willingness to break with the pack and to be skeptical of conventional wisdom. I got a memorable lesson in 1995 when I was covering the tobacco industry for the Wall Street Journal. That year, Philip Morris filed a libel suit against ABC News for $10 billion. After ABC reported that the tobacco giant and its rivals added extra nicotine to cigarettes, ABC called this spiking. At the time, the media widely dismissed Philip Morris's lawsuit as a desperate publicity stunt designed to distract the public. A public relations gamble, the, the sentiment went, that was sure to lead to a resounding courtroom defeat. I wasn't certain if Philip Morris was blowing smoke. So my Wall Street Journal colleague, Amy Stevens, and I dug into how ABC had assembled its piece. Our resulting story demonstrated that Philip Morris's libel case against the network was much stronger than had been assumed. Our piece did not make us popular with other journalists. But two months later, before the suit was set to go to trial, ABC suddenly settled with Philip Morris. The settlement required ABC to apologize on air for the false claim of spiking, which the network did a remarkable three times, including a widely viewed Monday night football broadcast. I continued to report on how the tobacco industry was manufacturing its lethal product. At the end of 1995, 
I stumbled on the real way that the industry kept its customers hooked. The industry's secret didn't involve adding extra nicotine. Instead, companies were adding ammonia chemicals to cigarettes in the manufacturing process. That addition intensified the potency of the nicotine that smokers inhaled. The revelation added fuel to a political and regulatory firestorm for the industry. Three years later, cigarette marketers agreed to a $206 billion settlement with 46 states for the public health costs associated with smoking. The settlement was the largest in US history. To me, the moral for journalists was clear. Keep an open mind, go where the reporting leads. Journalists aren't perfect, and we need to own that. Our audiences should demand that we set the record straight when warranted. Our subjects deserve redress if we have behaved recklessly or maliciously. The key question in today's polarized climate, though, is if. During the Q&A session, I'd be happy to address the New York Times versus Sarah Palin lawsuit that just ended in victory for the New York Times, as well as other important cases. But however a court ends up ruling, there is an understandable anxiety today among press, press freedom advocates about the chilling effect on journalists, the self-censorship that potentially comes from the rising tide of legal attacks from individuals and companies. There are many reasons why journalists may fall short as they uncover and sift through facts. Newsrooms typically are operating on limited budgets and they don't have the luxury of a close examination of complicated subjects. And by its very nature, writing the first draft of history invites error. In the heat of deadline, the confusion of the moment, the identity of the suspect, the size of the death toll, the account of the eyewitness, the prediction of the exit poll, any of these may be wrong. Maybe the journalist arrived at the scene too early or too late. There are just so many variables involved with getting it right. As is often noted, in 2016, most news outlets failed completely to report the possibility that Trump could win the US presidential election. Critics justifiably, country, um, excuse me, justifiably castigated us for groupthink and for predicting what we hoped would happen, not what was unfolding on the ground. But the paramount obstacle that journalists face today is that the honest pursuit of facts is extraordinarily difficult and dangerous, especially in volatile or repressive countries. In retrospect, I should have entitled this talk, The Power and Peril of Facts. The global pandemic offers a sobering lesson in the suppression of facts and the disinformation put out by governments, including democratic ones. In certain countries where Reuters operates, the US, Britain, China, Russia, Egypt, Indonesia, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Yemen, we chronicled deliberate efforts by the, these governments to underplay or squelch the severity of the COVID-19 crisis. Reuters systematically countered these official government narratives by gathering our own facts and statistics from non-official sources like hospital medics, coroners, and undertakers. At times, our reporting encountered serious pushback. In 2020, for example, we published an article saying that Iraq had thousands more COVID cases than the 772 that the government had reported. The Iraqi government got furious. They ordered us to close our Baghdad bureau, to apologize, and to pay a fine. 
We refused, and eventually the government relented. But this required concerted back-channeling for weeks and a public shaming of Iraq's then president by Christian Anampur on CNN. At a time when the world's need for accurate information is unprecedented, the journalists who deliver it are under relentless attack, even when they belong to distinguished news organizations. According to Freedom House, a Washington DC based nonprofit, only 13% of the population live in countries with a truly free press. Around the world, journalists face violence, legal constraints, harassment, and other barriers to doing their work. In the past several years, more than a dozen countries have imposed criminal laws against so-called fake news. These laws purport to apply to deliberate disinformation put out by journalists, but in fact, they are often used by governments to bury the unwelcome, unflattering news that governments don't want to see published. The number of journalists jailed by governments for truth-telling around the world hit another record in 2021. China remains the biggest jailer for the third year in a row, with 50 journalists behind bars. Last year, for the first time, Hong Kong journalists also were sent to prison following China's brutal pr crackdown on press freedom that, that came after um, Hong Kong's pro-democracy uh, protests. Also in 2021, Myanmar suddenly became the second biggest jailer of journalists after its military coup. Egypt, Belarus, and Vietnam rounded out the top five. For 21 journalists around the world, their fate was worse than prison. They were murdered in retaliation for their work. A little more than three years ago, Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post columnist and government critic, became a worldwide symbol of the open season on journalists. He was assassinated by Saudi government agents at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October 2018. My own news organization hasn't been spared from attacks and dangers in the line of duty. In 2017, my colleagues Wallon and Chasa'u were framed, arrested, and sentenced to seven years in prison because they fairly and accurately reported a horrific massacre of 10 Rohingya Muslim men in a small village called Indin. These 10 men were massacred by military and police forces. Despite private and public efforts by world leaders and our own intensive campaign, these two reporters remained behind bars for more than 500 days. When they won a Pulitzer in 2019 for their courageous coverage, they were still behind bars. In 2020, Reuters video journalist Kumara Gamechu was arrested on Christmas Eve and detained in Addis Ababa by Ethiopian federal police. He stayed in solitary confinement for 12 days, though he was never charged. The police claimed that they were investigating allegations that he disseminated fake news, assisted paramilitary groups, and breached anti-terrorism laws. Then, police suddenly dropped their investigation and Gamechu was freed in early January. To this day, we don't know why he was incarcerated in the first place. Last June, Reuters Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Danish Siddiqui was killed by Taliban fighters while covering a battle between Afghan special forces and the Taliban a month before the fall of Kabul. Siddiqui was mistakenly left behind on the battlefield by the Afghan military as they retreated. He was 38 years old. In the US, journalists have been under intensifying assault 
since, 19, excuse me, since 2017, when President Trump branded us some of the most dishonest people on earth, just 12 days into his presidency. As is the case around the world, the risk of assault and arrest by police recently has become a particular problem for US journalists covering the news from protests. Here are two high profile examples right in your own backyard. After the May 20 death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, journalists across the country were attacked, arrested, and had their equipment damaged in unprecedented numbers. Six Reuters journalists were caught up in police actions. According to the US Press Freedom Tracker, 423 journalists were assaulted and 155 were arrested. Of the documented assaults, fully 85% of them were committed by law enforcement. Last April, after the police killing of Dante Wright during a traffic stop in the suburb of Brooklyn Center, a federal judge issued a temporary restraining order to stop law enforcement from attacking, harassing, and retaliating against reporters covering protests. 21 journalists had been detained over three days of those demonstrations. But law enforcement is hardly alone in targeting American journalists. Trump's demonization of the media has continued to reverberate widely since the January 6th Capitol Hill riot, where journalists, like police officers, were attacked by diehard Trump supporters. The hatred of journalists also figures prominently online. And these are the online sites primarily that operate outside the mainstream. Here's just one of many examples. In 2021, two reporters at Reuters faced death threats as they published a year-long investigative series about a shocking campaign of violence and intimidation that targeted election officials and workers. This campaign of fear was orchestrated by Trump loyalists who refused to accept the outcome of the 2020 presidential vote. In November, as Reuters systematically unmasked the uh, people who had issued these extreme threats, our own reporters became victims of attacks via phone calls, voicemails, texts, and messages on social media. And I'd like to read one of them. This came from one man in a text. He said, quote, you are all done. You are all going to fucking burn. And in all this anonymous man who became a key subject of our coverage sent the Reuters reporters more than 100 texts and voice messages. And you know, I've listened to them and they are just absolutely terrifying. Our reporters, however, I guess having more fortitude than I do, um, continued, continued digging. At its best, trustworthy news can shatter the status quo for public good. We all remember a century ago, the famous declaration of Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis that sunshine is said to be the best of disinfectants. That still holds true today. And I am continually humbled by the brilliance and dedication of the journalists who make this happen. For instance, after Reuters investigated the terroristic threats against election workers, government action quickly followed. The Justice Department announced a task force to address the, the threats. And in recent days, this task force has indicted two men, um, in both cases um, directly responding to facts about them that um, were exposed in our stories. And Democratic members of the House and Senate have introduced legislation that would make it a federal crime to intimidate or threaten an election worker. Legislators in Vermont, Maine, and Washington are crafting similar state laws. I wanna emphasize that a desire for fact-based news 
endures around the world. The problem is that the public's support for responsible journalism mostly gets drowned out by a cacophony of rage and vitriol on social media. One study from the, a University of Oxford think tank showed that trust in news grew six points on average during the COVID-19 pandemic, with 44% of the sample saying they trust news most of the time. Another study from the American Press Institute said that a majority of Americans supported only one of journalism's five core values, but this particular value, that more facts lead to truth, is supported by fully 67% of Americans. Again, though, the message from the public is bewilderingly mixed because these very same studies show that large minorities of people have very negative views about how journalists do their jobs, particularly negative in the US. The issue of objectivity is particularly contentious, both among news consumers and journalists too. Many, especially millennials and Gen Z um, generations, regard impartial, objective journalism as old-fashioned and unsexy. They also argue that objectivity is impossible. Everyone has an opinion, the argument goes, so claiming to be objective is hypocritical. Here's my counter-argument. Like everyone else, journalists have opinions. I do too. But it is our responsibility to put these aside as we gather, assess, and provide facts to news consumers. Journalism began as, and should remain, a craft. And a craft is not a partisan campaign. As world events unfold against a treacherous and polarized backdrop, my own media organization continues to play it straight to stand above the fray, to truth squad facts, to take no sides in partisan vendettas, whether in the content we publish or on social media, and to publish uncomfortable, dangerous truths that serve the public interest. In my decade at Reuters, I am particularly proud that in the face of daunting even existential threats from governments, companies, and individuals, we have never suppressed a story. It's quitting time for me, if we ever do. And now back to that pop quiz I began with. It was designed to test how much you value trustworthy information, and whether you feel it is a personal and civic imperative to defend all journalists who provide it. I think you know my answers, and now I'd like to hear yours. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alex. And if it's okay, we'll do some Q&A now? Sure. Perfect, okay. Uh, before we do the Q&A, I do have one little announcement to make, and that is that the convocation, the post-convocation lunch series is back. So, we do have a few seats at the table, so if anyone is interested in joining us after, at uh, about noon, we'll try to keep it as close to noon as possible, uh, at the AGH, please talk to me, and uh, I would love to sign you up. We'll have a delicious, uh, delicious lunch and conversation with Alex, so please let me know afterwards. But now it's time for Q&A, and I know I saw one hand right there. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. You said that if writers ever suppressed the truth, it would be quitting time for you. Where would you go then if that were to happen? I think maybe the way to free, reframe the question is who would have me? <laughs> Haven't given it much thought. Uh, just, uh, just to... Um, I, I don't want to give you a, a glib answer. 
Um, you know, the fact is um, that under the trust principles I alluded to, um, you know, we are pledged to publish um, not only um, independent um, and impartial news, but also reliable news. And so the, if, if you know, if we were, um, you know, not publishing, um, you know, um, you know, publishable information, um, that would be a very uh, serious breach. And frankly, um, before I quit, I should get fired. And then they, no one really would want me. Early on in your discussion, you talked about the premises and that sometimes the reporting would run up against them. Can you distinguish between premises and lack of objectivity? Sorry, I'm having, I'm having a little, I, I was having a little trouble hearing your, your okay. question. Okay, you talked about premises of, the, of some of the reporting. How do you square that with objectivity? If, you're, if your story starts with premises, how is that different from not being objective? No, okay, that's a, that's a very that's a very good um, you know question. I, I mean, everyone um, you know who who does journalism you know goes into a story with an idea of what that story is is about. But you, as you, I mean, you you know, it's helpful at any at, at least at the beginning to be able to say in twenty five words or less, you know, this is what I plan to be writing about. But what I'm trying to say is that you, as reporting unfolds, you go where the facts lead you, and so you develop you know, your, your premise, but it's not based on opinion. It's forged in the crucible of, of the facts that, that you have gathered. And I, then I said further that you know, in, in most um, stories, there is one sort of overarching truth, but there are also um, plausible competing truths that we don't want to sort of sweep under the rug. I mean, the, the, the simplest way of describing this is that when I review stories, I always think of what would be the brainiest, most credible letter to the editor that a critic would, would write the next day demolishing a story. And I want to bake all those brainy, lucid, you know, counter arguments into the story, but you should, as a reader, still have, based on the facts we present, an overarching, you know, sort of takeaway. And uh, does that make sense? Um, hi, so you talked about, oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. Um, but you talked about like giving both sides kind of a chance to speak. So if you're like maybe talking badly about someone or reporting something that might cast them in a negative light as giving them the opportunity to respond. But I know that um, some journalists are kind of pushing back against that in the terms of small like fringe radical groups like for example um reporting on a QAnon protest that might have an impact of like 50 people but if you report and give them a voice then it has a nationwide impact yeah. so i'm just curious to hear what you think about like amplifying the voices of people like that or white supremacists or just something that can cause more harm than maybe fact that's a really that's a really good question. Um, you know, my, my attitude um, about this is that we absolutely have to seek fair comment. That doesn't always mean that we use the fair comment. If the, if the fair comment is not true, if it's not germane, um, this is why God invented editors. <laughs> but, but the point is, as much as possible, um, you know, we do try to seek comment because sometimes, um, you know, the comment actually is not only interesting, it could cause us to reevaluate, um, you know, whether our story is accurate and whether we should even be pubbing it. I, I, you know, to your specific question, um, I understand, you know, the perils of, of 
of amplifying, but um, you know, I, I still think net net, um, you know, fair comment, um, seeking fair comment is a cardinal rule of, of journalism. And I, I, I realize this answer may be a little bit um, unsatisfying because, again, you know, a, a, a journalism is kind of split second and situational, and the decisions you would make for one story, you might not, you know, make for another. So um, I, I probably, to really decide, I would have to, you know, see the see the story. Does that? Answer your question. Yeah. You talked earlier about uh, the four, what you called the fourth estate and the fifth estate yeah. being uh, journalism and social media, and it can sometimes feel, at least I think it can sometimes feel like sort of the wild west of media right now and journalism, uh, as, as far as social media goes. So. How do you improve that system and the interaction between those two estates? Is that rein, uh, reintroducing the fairness doctrine or is that greater control through social media companies or is there something else entirely that you can to do to distinguish, say, proper you know, news yeah. organizations from fringe news organizations like One American News or something like that? Yeah, um, well, everything you say um, is true and accurate, thank you. Um, and, and my simple answer for you is I'm not sure. Um, you know, I was fumbling for notes here because interestingly right now there's a whole um, fact-checking industrial complex that has arisen and I, I'm just gonna look at some numbers here. Um, apparently um, as of June um, 21, the Duke Reporters Lab counted 300 and 41 active fact-checking initiatives operating in 102 countries. And, um, and, and we actually um, have partnered with um, Facebook along with many other um, you know, media organizations to sort of you know, fact-check and truth squad facts. So, I mean, that's one um, thing that's going on, but candidly, I don't think it's making a dent. Um, the only thing is that for citizens who are seeking accurate facts and want to truth squad information, um, there is just, you know, a vast ocean of, you know, um, places, w you know, where you can do that. There's PolitiFact and, you know, there, and, and again, this Facebook, um, you know, fact-checking initiative and, and the Washington Post does it a lot. Everyone's doing it. Again, I don't know if it's helping because as you say, the Wild West um, you know, is, is actually operating pretty much unfettered at the same time. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, you, your beat in, back in the day used to be the tobacco industry and I'm just wondering if you had a beat today, what would you wanna be covering? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I'd like to cover human rights around the world and more accurately, um, sort of the um, evaporation of human rights around the world and why it is that you know, the courts and tribunals that have been charged with um, you know, bringing um, uh, people accused of war crimes are hopelessly bogged down and largely ineffectual. So I would probably do something um, in uh, just sort of in kind of covering sort of the, the, the uh, I don't know if it would make for an entire beat, but I'd do it for a while, just the, the um, real um, uh, challenges. I mean, right, right now um, in China, since all the lawyers who were formerly defending um, you know, dissidents have themselves been imprisoned, and the same thing is happening in Hong Kong. Um, you know, it's it's sort of there's no there's no you know um, uh, lawyers. Um, there are no lawyers left in the most repressive countries um, again because they're all behind behind bars themselves, and there's not um, there's really not much 
um, if any, ac accountability for that. If, if I could have a follow-up to my first question, when I asked where would you go if you were not at Reuters, what I was really seeking was your opinion of another news, news organization that you feel share your journalistic ethics. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I totally um, misunderstood your, your, your question. Sorry about that. Um, well, I mean, there are many um, really, um, you know, good news organizations out there trying to get it right. I mean, you know, I was at the Wall Street Journal for 26 years, and um, I might go back there. Um, I also started at the New York Times, so I might go back there. Um, you know, what, what I probably um, would, would do, though, um, is to do something counterintuitive and to go to like a small um, local newspaper that was really struggling. I mean, frankly, that's why the Pulitzer Prizes were invented in the first place. It was to sort of really incentivize and reward, um, you know, local newspapers. And, you know, as we know, um, you know, local papers are just absolutely withering. And so, you know, I, I think it would be um, a sort of really um, worthy and worthwhile thing to try to, um, you know, um, work at a, at a local newspaper. I have two short questions. One is, would it help to bring back the Fairness Doctrine? And two, would it help to abolish undergraduate journalism? How, just to, to point one, how do you define the fairness doctrine? Well, uh, I think it was abolished by Reagan in public broadcasting in the 80s. When I grew up, you couldn't have partisan radio broadcasts. You, you, you couldn't have partisan... Radio broadcasts right. like we do with Rush right. Limbaugh. Right, yeah. Um, To be, and and the second and your second question was abolishing student journalism. Un, under uh, I feel that many of the journalists I hear majored in journalism as an undergraduate, and they do not have a liberal education like you had, and mm -hmm. so they're totally ignorant about things. I remember in the Balkan problems, they got the countries mixed up. Slovakia and Slovenia on public radio. Okay. Um, well, it, it, to, the, to the fairness doctrine, um, and I'm sorry, I, I um, had sort of misremembered that I had misremembered the, the, the Reagan, um, you know, context. You know, I believe in freedom of expression. And so, you know, I don't think that, um, I, 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 I don't think that particular, um, you know, Fairness rules should be imposed on um, on the media. I personally believe in fairness. I want to read, um, you know, um, and and watch um, things that present both sides and that I can trust in. I'm not sure I would go so far as to resurrect, um, you know, uh, that. Go on. If I could defend the fairness doctrine, I believe it was based on we have a limitation on the broadcast spectrum. And that is different from a printing press, which anybody can make a printing press, but it's the public spectrum that is used and that ought, ought not to be partisan. When the broadcasting began, President Hoover said he would be shocked if it was used for a commercial purpose. Okay, what I will tell you is, because I don't have papal infallibility, I'm gonna go to school a little on this, and, and actually I, I need to get my facts more 
um, in, a, in a row before I can, my ducks in a row before I can really persuasively um, argue um, for or against. Um, I will perhaps more successfully tackle um, your second question, um, which is about um, undergraduate, um, you know, journalism. I mean, to be honest, um, you know, I'm not a huge believer in J school, um, either undergraduate or graduate. Um, you know, I think the best um, journalists probably have are broadly educated and um, also today um, have some sort of a specialty, some specialized knowledge, whether it's science, law, me medicine, um, where they can really bring some expertise to bear on subjects while being able to sort of write in a, in a way that is broadly um, accessible to, to, to the public. So, I mean, I guess, you know, I do think, um, as you were suggesting, that nothing replaces um, a sort of broad liberal arts education, you know, undergrad, and at the graduate level, I do have some questions about the value of, of um, journalism school. We have time for one last question, if we may, and that's our, one of our local journalists. Hi, Alex, thanks for being here. Um, could you tell, give us your take on the Sarah Palin versus New York Times case, please? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, 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 hope, I hope I'm not being recorded. Um, uh, look, um, I, I think that the criminalizing or the attempt um, to criminalize mistakes um, is very, very dangerous. Um, you know, the New York Times made a mistake and it was a bad one. Essentially, um, what they did was they suggested that a map um, that had been put out by Sarah Palin's um, political, political action committee, um, they, they, th this map was put out, it sort of targeted um, 20 Democratic districts um, in um, Arizona, which happened to be um, Democratic um, <laughs> sort of districts. And um, there was sort of a stylized um, crosshair put over each of these districts to sort of signal um, that they should be targets. And w what happened was that um, the, the New York Times said that this map um, suggested that, that she um, was trying to in, incite people to violence um, in, in, in an Arizona mass shooting, which had um, actually um, wound up, uh, there was a Democratic um, representative named um, Gabrielle Gifford, who wound up being shot in the head. So, in this, you know, two, 2017 editorial, the Times, in sort of glancing fashion, you know, made reference back to the, this 200, to, sorry, 2011 mass shooting, implying that Sarah Palin was inciting people to violence. 12 hours, and it was incredibly sloppy and careless because in the same editorial, they linked to something from ABC News um, refuting the theory. <laughs> so 12 hours, however, after this was published, the mistake was corrected. So, you know, the, the New York Times corrected its error promptly, and it, you know, totally, um, you know, acknowledged it. Uh, Sarah Palin um, took the view that, you know, she was being defamed, that um, the New York Times deliberately made this, you know, introduced this mistake because they didn't like her. Um, you know, a, I, I think the fact that, um, you know, the, the judge, um, you know, sort of um, handed victory to, to the New York Times um, was, was, you know, absolutely, um, you know, the, the, the correct thing to do. But, you know, there's no celebration going on in media land today because Supreme Court Justices um, Gorshak and Clarence Thomas have already signaled that they think that, um, you know, the, the bar um, or the, 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 that there's too much forgiveness, um, you know, for, um, 
for, for negligence as, as opposed to sort of recklessness. I mean, under, under for um, people who may not be aware, there was a very famous um, decision in um, 1964, it's the New York Times versus Sullivan, that basically holds that if you are negligent, um, you are off the hook. Um, if you are reckless, you are not off the hook. You're, you know, you're, you're, and, and so essentially, um, this has given you know, the media quite a bit of um, latitude and you know, the Supreme Court again has signaled that they wanna tighten up and you know, Sarah Palin um, it, you know, may well appeal. And so, you know, it's kind of an open question, um, you know, as what, to what's gonna happen. I mean, broadly speaking today, what we're seeing is that um, litigants are basically using um, the court system to stop the presses. I mean, there, it, there are defamation suits, there are suits claiming invasion of privacy, um, and also, you know, temporary um, restraining orders in, in certain cases are being um, sought to sort of um, block, block the news. Thank you very much, Alex, once again, for being here. Thank you all for being here. That concludes our convocation for today. <laughs>